So the, uh, the baseball playoffs are going on right now, and, and I'm a baseball fan. I love playoff baseball. It's when uh, you, know, the, you see the little things that happen in the course of a baseball game really be talked about and elevated because every play matters. Uh, there's a short season now. It's, it's almost over, and so that magnifies every situation and every uh, game, and, and so it, it's fun to watch, and it's fun to remember uh, different uh, uh, World Series and playoffs that have gone on in the past past that you've seen some big plays stand out in the history of, of World Series baseball. My, my son called uh, or sent a text a few weeks ago and said, hey, I'm going to listen to Daryl Strawberry speak at this church. And, and he sent it in this family uh, group chat. And so my daughters asked, who is Daryl Strawberry? You know, what's going on? Why are you going to listen to this guy? And, and uh, we just... It, filled them in that he's an old retired baseball player. He played on the, on the Mets in the 80s, and the, the Mets won the World Series in 1986. And, and really, the New York Mets were one of those teams that uh, experts thought would go on to win World Series after World Series. They had an, an extraordinary team as far as talent went. They had a, a bright young right fielder, Daryl Strawberry, who led the league in home runs and, and was exciting to watch. They had uh, probably the best pitcher in the major leagues at the time, this guy by the name of Dwight Gooden, who was only in his 20s and, and had a long career ahead of him. They, they were filled with past uh, home run champions like George Foster and left field, all-star catcher Gary Carter. They were, they were an all-star kind of team, and, and it was easy to see why folks would believe that they would not only win that World Series, but they'd win the next World Series and the next World Series, and they could be this dynasty sort of of team. They were also, though, a team that was filled with dysfunction and uh, had athletes give way to uh, addiction and all kinds of issues off the field. They had a famous fight with four of their players in a restaurant, just a lot of dysfunction that led to sort of that team maybe not meeting their full potential. That team never became the team that folks thought it might be. You know, I, I love to think about teams and to be a part of teams, and, and the very most important team that I've ever been a part of is the church, and the church is a, is a team that, that has this tremendous destiny. It's a team that Scripture describes as, as standing up against the enemy of all enemies, that the gates of hell will not prevail against her. It's a, it's a team that each one of us wants to see reach its full potential. We want the church to simply be the church. And I think in Romans chapter 14, there, there's some sometimes, if we're honest, as a part of any team, there's some dysfunction that creeps in, and that's true of all teams. That's true of the church even. There's some things that sometimes get in the way, dysfunction that creeps in, that gets in the way of the church being the church. And so I think these three priorities that are taught in Romans chapter 14 that, that help us think about the church as the church and to be that team that God intends for his team to be are, are important. We're going to do our best to cover all of Romans chapter 14 as we discuss these three priorities this morning. So I'm going to break this chapter up and just read the section of scripture that we're dealing with in each one of the priorities as, our work, as we work our way through. Priority number one is in essentials, we need to practice unity. We need to have unity in essentials and in matters of opinion, liberty. In essentials, we need to practice unity and matters of opinion, we need to exercise some freedom, some liberty. Uh, I want to take a look at the first four verses here in Ro Romans chapter 14. God's word says this, as for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions. One person believes he may eat anything, while the weak person eats only vegetables. Let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains, and let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats, for God has welcomed him. Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It is before his own master that he stands or falls, and he will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make him stand. In essentials, unity, and matters of opinion, liberty. As for the one, verse 1, chapter 14 says, as for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions. It's, it's an interesting uh, 
beginning to this chapter, we, we have this conversation about the, the weak in faith. And it's not really until Romans chapter 15, verse 1, that we get the other side of the coin, the strong in faith. But, but it's sort of assumed here, isn't there? If there's, if there's somebody who's weak in faith, then there's somebody who's strong in faith. And, and I, I kind of struggled with this th- this week. I thought, well, what in the world does Paul mean, though, weak in faith? What, what, are, we, what are we talking about? And I, I think there are a couple things that are pretty obvious from the text that we're not talking about. We're not talking about somebody who's, who's sort of maybe a believer or maybe not a believer. We're not dealing with an issue that, that uh, impacts someone's salvation. We're, we're going to talk just in a minute in verse 4. It says God has welcomed him onto his team as a part of his family. This is somebody who's uh, secure in the relationship with Jesus. So it's not a salvation issue really. I, I don't even think it's a maturity issue necessarily or a knowledge issue. It's just this difference of opinion that causes Paul to describe uh, one set of believers in the church in Rome as weak and another as strong. I I thought, what are some modern day equivalents that we could use to sort of understand this? And and I thought, well, maybe we're talking about conservative believers and liberal believers. And I thought, well, we could use that language, but I'm not sure if it applies. And it, it just has some negative, both sides, negative connotations to it, right? Uh, uh, maybe we're, we're talking about uh, uh, believers who are, or are mature or immature in their faith, but I don't really think that's what Paul is driving at. I, I struggled with this idea of weak because if you think, hey, you, are you a weak believer or a strong believer? I mean, which one do you want to be? I was uh, doing some work, and, and I was searching for something, and, and a video came up in response to the search that I made, and, and I'm not sure what I was looking for now. This is several months ago, but the video clip that came up uh, was for a world's strongest man competition from what had to be the late 70s or early 80s. I, it was Lou Ferrigno was in the video clip, so I watched for a few minutes, and, and it was just one part of this competition that they called made-for-TV event that they called the world's strongest man competition. And in this event, it had like eight bodybuilders who had this metal bar that they were given. And the the whole game was to bend the metal bar to this certain point. I think it was like six inches. So the two ends bend it to within six inches. And the fastest one to do that was the winner. And so I'm watching this video clip of these eight bodybuilders bend this metal bar bar literally with their bare hands. And, And I assumed that there were some rules. And nobody put it on the ground and put their, you know, bend it up. You couldn't do that. You couldn't get it. One guy was disqualified because he got it too far up into his forearms and used that to bend it. So it had to be held in your bare hands and then bent. But you could put it, uh, some guys were putting it behind their neck and bending it. Some guys were bending it over a knee. Uh, some guy, one guy put it over his head, which doesn't seem like a good idea. But I mean, I'm not going to tell the guy. He's the world's strongest man, you know, and so I'm not going to inform him. That's dumb. Although now he's like 77 or something, right? I mean, maybe. I'm still not going to tell him. But anyway, they were bending this, and, and nobody got it in the time that it was set for. So they were measuring, you know, the, the closest distance that the two ends came would be the winner. And they had different lengths, eight inches or seven inches, nine inches, however far it was. And I just thought, somebody lost this competition. This is a group of individuals who are literally bending a metal bar in their bare hands to become the world's strongest man, and somebody finished dead last. And I just thought, would we describe that guy who finished dead last, is he a weakling? You know, I'm not telling the guy he's 78 years old that bending it over his head, I'm still not confronting him, right? We would never describe that person in that way. And and I think we ought not get lost in the language here too much in Romans chapter 14. When, When Paul describes one set of believers in the church in Rome as being weak in faith, It doesn't have much to do with their relationship with Jesus or who they believe, I should say, who they believe Jesus to be or what Jesus has done for them. 
It's, it's just kind of a, a difference of opinion about how best these believers could honor Jesus. And they felt pretty strongly about it, I think, but, but that was the difference of opinion that was happening. And, and Paul says, hey, as for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions. You want to invite them and include them and have them be a part of the church. And this, this word for welcome means to, to really be a part of their life. The idea is not just to hey, sit next to somebody in worship, but don't have anything to do with them. That's not the, the concept here. It's a participate in service. I I think about ministries that we have going on at Wallula Christian Church that are an example of this welcoming other believers that, that maybe we have differing opinions with. I think about our third Thursday meal that's done in cooperation with, with uh, the Sisters of Charity. I think about the shelter of hope that we serve in that's done, uh, done in cooperation with churches all across the Leavenworth uh, County from differing denominations and faith backgrounds and, and that service as value even even if we have differing opinions in, in other matters of faith. I, I'm thinking about our, our Thanksgiving celebration on November 14th, where we're inviting folks to the churches who have participated with us in this United as One event yearly, and to gather together to be able to eat with them and, and uh, share some dessert with them, to worship and pray together. Those are examples of how we can welcome one another, even if we have some differing opinions, how we can do life with one another. Paul uses the same Greek word in Philemon, in that letter that we, we call the book of Philemon, in, in verse 17, when he, he says, I'm sending this guy back to you, a, a slave back to a master, and I want you to welcome him as you would welcome me, right? With the same rights, the same conditions, the same enthusiasm, with the same attitude that you would welcome me. I want you to welcome him back into relationship with you. And, and, and so we, we need to participate in, in life with other believers, even if we might have differing opinions. Uh, Paul goes on to say, but not to quarrel over opinions. The point isn't to invite them back so you can tell them how wrong they are. It's not to, to start this argument. And, and he goes on in verse 2 to give an example of what these opinions are. What are these differing opinions that the church in Rome was struggling with? Well, one example is in verse 2, one person believes he may eat anything while the weak person eats only vegetables. And, and so there was this issue with, with some believers not eating meat. And, and that might seem a little bit odd to, to us. There, there's no physical condition here. There's no allergy that, that causes this or, or physical condition that might cause somebody to abstain from meat uh, that we know of then. It was a, it was a physical uh, or a spiritual uh, opinion that, that caused this. And, and all kinds of reasons for that, perhaps. Uh, uh, some uh, Christians in Rome maybe had grown out of a pagan culture that had forbid the eating of meat. Some folks were, were perhaps uh, Jews who were concerned about how that meat w was prepared, and so Jewish cr Christians who were still holding to Old Testament dietary laws and, and didn't want to risk that meat being uh, deemed unclean, so they would refuse to eat that meat. Still other uh, believers, perhaps Jewish Christians or uh, Gentile Christians who uh, knew that most of the meat that was sold in the marketplace was offered to idols prior to that, and so uh, they didn't want to be associated with that idol worship and the eating of that meat, and so they chose to abstain from that uh, that eating of, uh, of meat, and, and that was their opinion that, hey, I can best honor God by, by choosing not to eat this. And, and Paul goes on in verse 3 to say then, let not the one who eats despise Despise the one who abstains, and let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats. This is pretty strong language here. Don't, don't despise one another. Don't pass judgment. That's the, that's the strong Greek word, by the way, that, that means to condemn. It, it's used in other ways even in this chapter, but, but here that's the idea of judgment here is to stand in place of God, to, to usurp God's authority and rights and condemn someone for the choices they make. Instead, we're to welcome that individual. And there's, there's three reasons or ways that, that that are here in verses three and four that we ought, that we ought to welcome uh, someone who differs in opinions uh, about these. But before we get there, I guess let, let's explain this. These opinions are are things that that aren't included in Scripture. 
right? When, when God's word says, hey, do this, or God's word says, don't do this, then we have to pay attention to what God says to do or not to do. We need to pay attention to pay attention to those those moral commands in our lives. And there's lots of places, though, where we're doing our best to decide based on principles taught in Scripture, what does that look like in this area of my life now? There's no chapter and verse that I can go to that says, behave like this in this situation. And so we're all doing our best based on principles taught in Scripture to figure that out. And that's sort of the opinions that, that the church in Rome was dealing with. That's the opinions that tend to get us in trouble today. Now, more and more, we're kind of looking at God's Word and saying, yeah, I know it says that, but my opinion says I don't have to pay attention to it. And that, that's the attitude that we have to avoid, all right? That's the attitude that we don't want to don't want to get caught up in. But when there's this differing of opinion sort of in these gray areas, I'm not, a, I'm not a fan of that terminology, but those gray areas, then we need to welcome one another. Why? Well, because verse 3 says God has welcomed him. Because God has, has included that believer as a part of his family. And so if, if God says he's on the team, then we ought to include them on the team. Verse 4 says, who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It's before his own master that he stands or falls. This is why judgment is not a, a good idea in the first place, because God stands in that position, and our judgment doesn't matter all that much. Right? That's essentially what Paul is saying. What difference does your judgment make here anyway? Uh, to me, it's sort of like a, a, a football team that has two quarterbacks. One quarterback's playing, maybe he's struggling a little bit. And, and so the fans say, man, we want the backup quarterback. You know, put in the backup quarterback. And that becomes the opinion of the fan base. The only problem is, is that opinion doesn't matter. They're not in position of authority, of decision-making to, to change that player, to change that lineup. And so that opinion, that judgment doesn't make uh, much difference. And, and here Paul is essentially saying that, look, God has welcomed these folks onto his team and God will judge every one of you at some point, Paul says, every one of us, all believers, all people. And so it's his judgment that matters. And finally, we, we welcome them. We do life with, with folks that maybe we have differing opinions uh, in these gray areas with because, and he will be upheld for the Lord is able to make him stand. Because every one of us is relying on Jesus to stand before God on that judgment day. As a follower of Jesus, every one of us will give an account, verse 13, I think it here, here is in Romans chapter 14 says, before God. And when God looks at us, when we stand before God on that judgment day, he sees the blood of Jesus. Uh, he, it's because of Jesus that we're able to stand before God. And so we, we can welcome uh, other believers when we have this, this essential right, the most important essential, I wouldn't limit it only to the person and the uh, who Jesus is and what Jesus has done, but when I think of essentials, that's where you start, and that's, that's a good list, right? When we get this Jesus right, who he is and what he has done for us, then some of these other opinions we can discuss, and we can, we can do life with these folks. Jesus is that unifying authority under which his team lives and serves. In essentials, there needs to be unity. In matters of opinion, there can be liberty. Another way of saying this that sometimes we, we, we talk about is that when the Bible speaks, we want to speak. And when the Bible's silent, maybe it's wise, the, the wisest decision for us to be silent. In essentials, unity. In matters of opinion, liberty. Uh, Priority number two is that above all, we honor God in all. Above all, honor God. Hey, Paul goes on in verse 5 to say one person esteems one day as better than another. He's giving another example of opinions here, right? Is, some people have different opinions on how we treat each day. Uh, one person esteems one day as better than the other, while another esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. 
The one who observes the day observes it in honor of the Lord. The one who eats, eats in honor of the Lord, since he gives thanks to God, while the one who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord and gives thanks to God. For none of us lives to himself, and none of us dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother, or you, why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God, for it's written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. So Paul launches into this discussion about days, and and probably Paul is talking about Old Testament celebration festival days here and and some Jewish Christians were probably still following those and, and wondering should we continue to follow those maybe he has in mind the Sabbath should we keep the Sabbath and and those sorts of days and and some esteem them some value those days and some treat every day the same uh, as the other and and sort of if you put it in our terms look we, we we've come to worship together and we've come to worship together on a Sunday and we we worship together on a Sunday Sunday because the, the early church started to worship on Sundays. Why? Because, well, that unifying authority under which we all fall, Jesus was raised from the dead on a Sunday. And so that became tradition to worship on a Sunday. Uh, does that mean that, that churches who, who maybe, uh, you know, on, uh, on Easter services, we've had Easter service on a Saturday night here. Is that a, is that a sin because it's not on a Sunday? Is that a bad thing to do because it's not on a Sunday? I know a church in, in Las Vegas that meets on Mondays because so many folks are involved in the hospitality uh, industry that Monday seems to be a day that, that they can gather together to worship or, or uh, a new thing in the church world is to have worship services during the week on Thursday nights. Are those, are those sins? Or should we not be worshiping together? I, I think we ought to be worshiping together, right? Scripture's pretty clear in Hebrews chapter 10, don't stop meeting together. And so that's the chapter and verse we have. That's the instruction from God that we have. We have the example of the early church worshiping on Sundays, but God hasn't said, hey, don't worship on a Thursday or don't worship on a Monday. Day. In fact, sort of the principle taught throughout Scripture is every day is all of our life is a worship service to God. And so uh, probably it's all right to gather on those days. But, but some folks are, if I, don't, if I don't come to church on Sunday, you know, the rest of my week's not going to be right. I'm going to be kind of off for the rest of the week. I think those are probably the opinions, the kind of opinions that the church in Rome was dealing with. And so Paul, in in verse 5, how does he say to fix it? He says, each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. Decide for yourselves, but be fully convinced in your own mind. In other words, you need to do the research. I saw a, a meme online and all this stuff that's happened in our world. I don't want to dive too deep into this, but uh, all, all the stuff that's going on in our world and thinking about vaccines and, and folks have different opinions about to be vaccinated or not to be vaccinated and that sort of thing. And, and uh, this meme said, stop saying that you researched it. Right? In other words, kind of the implication is, well, maybe you just, you just listen to folks who know better than you and stop researching it. And I just think that's a dangerous attitude to have about any area of your life, right? My first advice wouldn't be, hey, don't look into it. Don't study it. Don't research it. And in fact, if somebody from this stage ever tells you, hey, just trust me, this is what God says, don't research it. It's probably time for that person to go. You know, Acts chapter 17, verses 10 and 11, Paul is, has been on a mission trip, and he's traveling from city to city, and, and essentially in those verses, he says, this last place I went, man, those folks were a disaster. You know, they chased me out of town, that was a bad deal, but here I am in Berea, and when I preach in the synagogue in Berea, these folks listen, and then they go and they research it. They study the scripture to see if what I taught was true. And so maybe you've heard preachers or somebody say, you ought to be like the Bereans, you ought to be more of a Berean. In essence, what they're saying is research it, study it. And so in these matters of opinions from uh, 
God's word from his uh, principles we're trying to live out in our lives that maybe aren't directly addressed in scripture, we ought to study his word so we have a foundation and a basis for what we believe those principles are and how we ought to live them out. Paul says each one of you should be fully convinced in his own mind. The one who observes the day observes it in honor of the Lord. The one who eats, eats in honor of the Lord since he gives thanks to God, while the one who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord and gives thanks to God. In other words, both of these conclusions you come to might honor God. This is where it gets frustrating, right? Okay, I've done the hard work. I've been a diligent student of Scripture, and I've researched this, and I've prayed about it, and I've sought the advice of other wise and more mature believers, and I've, I've become fully convinced in my mind that this is what I ought to do. And here Paul says, that's good. And so when somebody has a difference of opinion here, and they've sought the advice of wise and more mature believers, and they've researched God's word, and they've studied and prayed, and they've come to a different conclusion. They've come to that different conclusion because they want to honor God too. And both of those decisions might honor God. Now, we need to back up just for a minute to sort of repeat something that I've said, I, I think. But if you look back at Romans chapter 13 and, and you go to verse 3, a couple of weeks ago we read just this list. It's not a complete list. None of, neither of these lists is complete. But in, in chapter 13, verse uh, 9, it says, You shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. Right? There are some directives from God that there's no way, it, it, there's no murder that honors God, right? There's no adultery that honors God. You, you know, you go a little later in the chapter and you get to verse 13, let us walk properly as the day, uh, as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy. You know, there, there are some choices we make that do not honor God. There's no way to say, this is my opinion about this. And I just, I'm just choosing this to honor God. For none of us lives to himself, and none of us dies to himself, verse 7 says. For if we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord. So Paul kind of jumps off the deep end here, doesn't he? He says, okay, here's some matters of opinion. You might have different uh, matters of opinion. Both can honor God. And then he talks about life and death, sort of the ultimate and opposites. Life and death. If you think about what he's been talking about, you know, celebration of, of these festival days and eating meat and drinking wine, and, and it's sort of the ultimate of whether you're partaking in those things or you're not partaking in those things, right? You've stopped partaking in meat sacrificed to idols when you're dead. You're not doing that anymore. It is that ultimate opposite kind of uh, situation. And, and I suppose Paul goes there to highlight how, how those things might be uh, opposite decisions and still honor God. Because as a follower of Jesus, both our life and our death honor God. You know, and, and some of his other writings, Paul says that to live is Christ and to die is gain. What does he mean? As long as I live, I'm going to serve Jesus. I'm going to serve Jesus. I'm going to love others. I'm going to be a part of his team. God's going to be glorified. He's going to be honored through those choices and service and my life. But he says to die is gain. Why? Because I'll be in the presence of Jesus. It doesn't become more intimate or close. That relationship doesn't have anywhere else to go. I'm in the presence of my creator. And so to die is gain. In both my life, I honor Jesus. and my death, I honor Jesus. 
And, and I suppose part of the reason he talks about this life and death, these extreme opposites here, and how they both honor Jesus is because, well, in verse 9 it says, For to this end Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. Because Jesus is this ultimate unifying authority under which we all fall. He's the most essential of essentials. And he lived, ministered, died, and raised from the dead. He conquered life and death. He's displayed why he is that ultimate authority with his death and resurrection. It goes on in verse 10 to say, Why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or why uh, do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. I just think a couple things should be highlighted here. First of all, Paul keeps referring to these folks as our brothers and sisters right, as our family, that when you are part of God's team, you are a part of his family, which makes those folks weak or strong, right or wrong, however you want to think about it. These folks that I might disagree with, have a difference of opinion with, they are your brothers and sisters in Christ. They are your family. It matters how you treat them. So then each one of us will give an account of himself to God. Ultimately, we're not to condemn someone else because we face judgment from God. You know, it's when your mom, your mom used to say to you, hey, worry about yourself. Right? Why, why would your mom, why would your parents say worry about yourself? Well, usually it was when you were tattling on your brother. Right? You wanted to get your sister in trouble. And here's the truth. It didn't have anything to do with you being concerned about the situation that your brother or sister, your sibling was in. You, you were not concerned about the outcomes, that they might be going down the wrong path. You weren't concerned about their spiritual development, right? It's because you were in hot water and you wanted to share the wealth, that tends to be, when we, when we think about judgment, when we read in the New Testament, hey, don't judge. That's not the New Testament teaching us, don't speak the truth. That's not the New Testament teaching us that when we've got chapter and verse and God says live like this, and we've got somebody that we love and care about not doing those things, ignoring God's principles, ignoring God's laws, that we ought not say, hey, what's going on? It's when we're, our attitude is, man, I'm in hot water, and I'd like to share some of that hot water with everybody else. I'd like to see that, that pain sort of inflicted on others. That's the kind of judgment that, that Paul is talking about in Romans chapter 14. Above all, honor God. Priority number three is to help, don't hinder others' walk. Uh, let, let's look at the, the end of the chapter here. Uh, we're going to read especially 13 to 20, and, and uh, we'll finish off the chapter, but that's where we're going to concentrate our time here. Verse 13 says, Therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of a brother. I know I am persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself, but it's unclean for anyone who thinks it's unclean. For if your brother is grieved by what you eat, you are no longer walking in love. By what you eat, do not destroy the one for whom Christ died. So do not let you regard uh, as... So do not let what you regard as good be spoken of as evil, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Whoever thus serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men, so then let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding." Don't hinder others' walks. And Paul begins in verse 13 by saying, Therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or a hindrance in the way of a brother. We are on the same team, and our goal is to help each other grow in our knowledge and relationship with Jesus. Don't get in the way. Don't allow these opinions to get in the way of that. 
We want to we have a, have a smooth-running surface towards Christ. I read an article recently about the question that was being asked is, are our athletes just bigger, stronger, and faster today than they used to be? Uh, is that why world records continue to be broken? And uh, Because at, people just get bigger and stronger and faster. And they were comparing two Olympic athletes, one Jesse Owens, who competed in the 19. 19- 32 Olympics in, in Germany, and, and Usain Bolt, who has competed in lots of Olympics, both have held world records at, at their times of, of uh, uh, when they were running and, and competing, and, and so they compared these times, and they said if Jesse Owens raced, if you took his best time, his world record time, and, and you compared that to Usain Bolt's world record time, then Bolt would win by three or four seconds. I don't remember exactly what it was, but in the world of sprinting, it was a huge difference. It's a blowout. It's a 10 nothing baseball game. It's, it's a disaster. Uh, you, you know, Jesse Owens would be way behind. They said, so probably, you know, people are just bigger, faster, and stronger. And then they said, wait a second, let's compare what these guys ran on. And so they compared the, the difference in time that, that somebody running on a modern track surface, you know, kind of these smooth, hard, uh, surfaces with starting blocks and all the advantages that folks have to the, today with that technology, compared that against the, the running track that Jesse Owens and those guys ran on, as well as cinder, it was ash, and they didn't have starting blocks. They, they took a trowel, a, a little shovel with them to the starting line. They dug a hole so they'd have some place to push off. And, and so they said, well, if you compare that and you take out the time advantage, the, the modern surface, then, then it's a, just a difference of a tenth of a second or something, and they're so close. They'd basically be tied. It would be such a close race. I mean, this makes sense. You don't have to be a world-class athlete to get this. If you've ever been to the beach and you've walked on the sidewalk along the edge of the beach, and then you've stepped off the sidewalk to walk on the beach, the sand, then you know your, your pace slows, doesn't it? The surface really matters. And, and this is what I need you to hear from all of that. That you, you might think, I need to come to church because I want to I get my life in order. I need to be a part of, of God's family because I need to know Jesus and I need to head in that direction. And I want my family to head in that direction. But your participation in this family matters more than that. That's a huge deal, right? Your, your, your eternity is no small potatoes. Your family's eternity matters. But look around. Every family's eternity matters. Every person in this room, every, every person that we go to work with, that we meet at the bowling alley, every person that we're hanging out with on a Friday night, their eternity matters. And your participation in God's family you know, that, that living in peace with one another that Paul has previously talked about, you know, that makes a difference for eternity, for this wide group of people, for each one of us. You know, verses 16, 17, and 18 describe what the church ought to look like. So do not let what you regard as good be spoken of as evil, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Whoever thus serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. So then let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. You'll, you'll hear people say sometimes, that uh, church growth experts say that folks are most likely to make a change in their spiritual life when they are dealing with trouble or transition or tension. So what do we want the church to look like? What do we want the church to be? Well, we want the church to be a place of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. We want people to look at that team and say, man, life doesn't have to be only about transition and tension and trouble. That there, there, there is a place, that there is a relationship, that there is an authority that I can, I can serve under and live under that can offer me that joy and that relationship and that peace from the Holy Spirit and a relationship with Jesus. 
why in verse 20, Paul says, do not for the sake of food destroy the work of God. Don't get in the way of what God would do through his team, through his church, for the sake of an opinion. Right? Paul is talking about an opinion that doesn't translate for us very much. Well, not for the sake of this meat, destroy the work of God. But I suppose, and I suppose that in the last year and a half, two years especially, that we could say, hey, do not for the sake of masks or vaccines or political party candidate, destroy the work of God. Right in the last election cycle, how many times did you hear somebody say, you can't vote either side, right? This came from both opinions. You can't vote for this candidate or that candidate. You can't support this party or that party and be a Christian. Don't, for the sake of opinions, don't, for the sake of the temporal, destroy the work of God. He goes on to offer a little advice and what that looks like. He says, yeah, everything is indeed clean, but it's wrong for anyone to make another stumble by what he eats. So just be concerned about those folks around you. It's good not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything that causes your brother to stumble. That faith you have, keep between yourself and God. You, you don't often hear preachers say that, keep your faith to yourself. And understand, again, you go back to the beginning of the chapter, we're not talking about this is who I believe Jesus is. We're not talking about that kind of big faith. It's shorthand for this Christian life and, and this faith and that decision, that conclusion you've reached in this matter of opinion. Again, you go back to sometimes your mom had good advice and she, she maybe told you once before, if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. You know, it didn't stick with me. She did her best, but it didn't work. But that's good advice, right? This matter of opinion, if we know that it's going to create this division, if we can't have this civil discourse and come to opposite sides of the conclusion if necessary, then keep it between yourself and God. Blessed is the one who has no reason to pass judgment on himself for what he approves, but whoever has doubts is condemned if he eats because the eating is not from faith, for whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. We don't want to be a hindrance in other believers walk with Christ, but we want to, to support it. We want to help and them know Jesus better. We don't want to be a, a church, a team that's known by its mistakes. That 1986 World Series, the Mets were playing the Red Sox, and uh, in a game six, it was uh, a game that the Red Sox were winning. They, they would have won the World Series, and uh, the Mets, though, came back and they tied it, and they were heading into the bottom of the 10th inning. They had a runner on third base, two outs. This guy at the plate uh, named Mookie Wilson hits a little ground ball to first base. And uh, some of you are old enough to remember that the man playing first base was this player by the name of Billy Buckner. Billy Buckner, what you need to know, had had a long and successful baseball career. He was, I would say, borderline Hall of Fame kind of player, had, was multiple all-star athlete, had, you know, had, was, had a successful season that year. He was playing on two bad knees. He was kind of at the end of his career, though, and he had fielded a ground ball at first base thousands and thousands of time, and this was a no-brainer. This was so easy. It wasn't hit hard. It was hit straight at him. It was just kind of bouncing along, and it continued to bounce right between his legs into right field, and the winning run scored. This guy who had a, a pretty successful Major League Baseball career is mostly known today as the first baseman who let Mookie Wilson's ground ball go to right field, and they lost game six and ultimately would lose game seven of the World Series to the 1986 Mets. Now, we don't want to be known by our mistakes. We don't have to be known by our arguments and disagreements. 
We want to be the church that really is the church. Let's stand and worship Jesus together.